Um, and I, I kind of I want to show this um, by a classical example. So one of the things that trees have real difficulty in is recovering decision boundaries that are oblique to the coordinate axes, right? So as I said before, the partition that you get is always parallel to the coordinate axis. So I simulated some data here. Um, the true decision boundary is this thick plate which is oriented obliquely to the coordinate axis. The green points and the white points are the true class labels. The left hand side is, is a cart tree, a shallow cart tree, and on the right hand side, the blue and red squares is a decision boundary. So it's a red square inside a blue square. Um, it's not doing a very good job, obviously. Well, grow the tree out a little more deeply, um, and you can see that the region that the decision region is becoming a little bit more complicated. You, you have two or three squares now that are sort of identifying the, the class labels. Grow it out more deeply and it's starting to look a little bit better. Go as far as you can and, and you've done a decent job. But the problem here is that um, variance goes up, right? Lots of degrees of freedoms are, is being expended here in growing this tree. Bias is low, variance is high, so you have a problem. Okay, um, so what we would do in that scenario is we would bag, okay, because it's, it works in these scenarios where there's high variance. Um, but why does it work? Okay, so we know, you know how to implement it. We know that it will work in the case where we have this instability, i.e. variance, but why does it work? And I just want to show you a, a very simple uh, explanation for how this works in the, in the case of a regression tree. So although I looked at a classification tree, it's a little bit easier to explain it, um, how it would apply in the case where your outcome is not a class label, but it's a continuous value. But this argument actually applies directly to classification trees and, and it can be extended to general outcomes as well. Okay, so here's the argument. Suppose this is your predictor, f hat. You're trying to predict y. It's based on some function. You don't know that function. And there's an error term. Um, Let's compute the generalization error. So the generalization error is, is kind of like the averaged, averaged, averaged error, okay? So give me um, a new x value from a test data set and the y value. How close can you predict that y value? Square it up and then average this out over the test data set and now average this out over the training data set, the learning data set that you actually grew f hat. So it's just averaging the square distance. Um, it's not hard to show, just take the square, expand things out, you'll see a cross product term disappears that you get the following expression, which is basically a mean square error decomposition. The first term is the internal noise, that's the lower bound to the generalization error. The second term is the bias, okay? So this is the difference between the true predictor and the mean of your predictor squared. And the, the other term is the variance. So that's the difference between your predictor and its mean value, okay? So you get this mean square error decomposition. Well, apply the same argument to the mean of your predictor, and you'll find that, um, in fact, that the generalization error is equal to the prediction error, the generalization error for the mean, plus this term here, which is the variance, right? So there's two things that follow from this. The prediction error for your predictor is always bigger than the averaged predictor, and the amount is equal to the variance, right? So by taking the average, you completely remove the variance. The variance drops to zero. Right? So, it's, so it, bagging is a variance reduction technique. Uh, and that sounds great, but there's of course one catch, right? Taking the average means that I'd have to average this out over uh, the training data set. So I'd actually have to have an infinite number of these independent data sets out there, which we don't have. In practice, we have one data set. So that's where the bootstrapping comes in. The bootstrapping acts like uh, a way of generating these, you know, pseudo ways of generating these, these training data sets. But the, that's the principle. Um, finally, as a corollary, if your original predictor is unbiased, then taking the average of it will also be unbiased. So what will happen here is the generalization error for your predictor will be just sigma squared. So the bias term drops off and the variance term drops off. So it's the perfect predictor. Taking an average of an unbiased predictor is the best thing to do. And that's sort of what bagging does, right? It takes a low bias, high variance predictor, like a tree with lots of degrees of freedom, and it turns it into a stable, more accurate ensemble learner. Okay, now here's the catch, and this is sort of the segue into random forests. 
Um, so you, 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 the, in the example that I showed you, there was just two variables. But in many problems, we have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of variables nowadays. Um, in those scenarios, this perturbation through bootstrapping is not enough to, to remove the, uh, to reduce the variance. What happens is that the trees that you build by these bootstrap samples um, aren't decorrelated enough, and you need to decorrelate them, okay? And the only way that you can decorrelate them is to change the technique. Um, and so this is really sort of the idea behind random forest. Okay, so what random forest does is it, instead of bagging a deep tree, it will bag a deep random tree. Okay, so inject another form of randomization into the process to reduce the variance. So it's, again, it's, it's a variance reduction technique. Um, so here's how Breiman described uh, random forest in his 2001 paper. Um, it's a combination of tree predictors such that each tree depends on the values of a random vector sampled independently and with the same distribution for all trees in the forest. So in other words, um, you basically construct random trees and then you aggregate them. Now, um, this can be done in, in many, many, many different ways, but the prescription that he laid out and studied in his paper, which is sometimes called random forest, random input, is actually very simple and involves three steps. So just like bagging, um, you draw B independent bootstrap samples. But here's the, here's the, the part where you infuse um, some more randomization into the tree growing process. For each, tr each node, when you're splitting the node, right, with this greedy splitting rule, instead of using all variables, select M tri of them, okay? So M tri is some number that's less than or equal to P, where P is the number of variables. So if M tri equals P, then you're selecting all the variables and you're gonna essentially do bagging. Um, in practice, M tri is far, much, much smaller than P. And then finally, um, you grow the tree deeply with um, a fixed node size. So for any given terminal node, the number of um, uh, values in that terminal node may have a lower bound on it, which is typically called um, node size. So to implement random forest random input, there's three variables or three tuning parameters, B, M, tri, and node size. Um, selecting B is very straightforward. This is just a computational issue. You can't overfit by growing too many trees, so it's just really a matter of how many trees you can grow computationally. Um, the two key variables are M, tri, and node size, and there are default settings that are used um, in the software that's available out there. And, and these work very well, and they're also fairly robust in most settings. But as I'm going to sort of get into later in my talk, um, once you start to get into these challenging problems, especially with high dimensional, um, with high dimensional um, scenarios, um, selecting M tri and node size has to be thought of very carefully. You really have to think carefully about how to, how to tune these parameters. And I'll show you um, some theory for, in, for how, to, how to actually do that. Um, just to mention that there are many uh, other approaches for random forest that actually are very, very similar to Bryman's method. Um, Ho's decision forest, especially uh, Ahmed Gieman's shape recognition papers are really sort of independently discovered random forest. In fact, they really influence Bryman's work a lot. Um, so there are many, many ways of growing random trees. Okay, so now um, let me sort of get into uh, variable importance, um, variable selection. So in forests, so up to this point, we've been talking about prediction error. Now let's sort of think about being able to select variables. And the way that this is done uh, almost exclusively, predominantly in the literature is to use variable importance, measures of the predictiveness of a variable. I like to call it VIMP. Okay, so this is a prediction error based approach. Not surprisingly, forest is a prediction error approach. So it's not surprising that the, the traditional way of doing this is, is based on that concept. Um, so what one would does is, it get, is to construct these VIMP measures um, and then rank variables based on it and then filter the variables um, based on that, that ordering. And computing VIMP is, is actually quite straightforward. Um, so for each tree, uh, you just run out of bag data down the tree. So remember, each tree is grown using bootstrap data. The data that's left out, about 37% um, of the data, is called out of bag. That, you can use that as test data. So you run it down the tree. Let's suppose V is your variable of interest. Whenever you come to a split, if that split is on V, just make a random assignment. Go left or right randomly, okay? So you kind of mess up the, the, 
uh, the path of the, of, the, of the data point. Now, if V is an important variable, what will happen is that the terminal node assignment for the data point is going to be far away from its actual original um, terminal node assignment. And that is how you can um, determine whether V is informative. Okay, so the second part is from uh, doing this sort of noising up, determine the outer bag ensemble. Okay, so for each individual, you have about th uh, 370 trees out of th 1,000 that um, were out of bag, and use those, average them out, and from this, compute the prediction error. So this is the prediction error for the noised up variable. Now calculate the prediction error for the original, um, uh, the original predictor um, using the, uh, its out of bag ensemble. Then to compute VIMP, just take the difference between the two. So basically, if you noise up a variable, it's gonna increase its prediction error. And the difference between that and the original prediction error is the VIMP. The larger mm -hmm. it is, the more positive it is, the more, in, the more indication that that variable is informative. Here's just a, a sort of a simple illustration of this. I wanna return to the oblique decision boundary, the simulated data that we just looked at. So here's the, um, the carved out decision boundary and the true uh, classification labels color coded. On, uh, on this figure here is the prediction error when I noised up the X variable, okay? And here's the prediction, uh, sorry, here's the prediction for uh, when I noised up the Y variable. So you can see that by noising up the variables that the prediction uh, is being affected and when you compute the prediction error, you will be easily able to find that both variables are informative, okay? Um, all right, so now I wanna kinda get into a, an example in a little more detail. Um, this is actually ongoing work, but the, the results are interesting, I guess, and exciting enough that I thought it would be, make a nice example for, for today's seminar. Um, so this is related to uh, myelodysplastic syndromes, or what's known as MDS. Um, and these are um, a collection of uh, varied um, uh, diseases which affect the, the bone marrow. Um, so within the bone marrow um, are blood stem cells, and these blood stem cells produce other um, blood cells. But in MDS patients, the blood stem cells are affected in such a way that, the, um, that they're not able to produce enough healthy blood cells. And as you can imagine, this has serious consequences for the health of the patient. Um, Roughly, in fact, uh, about a third of MDS patients will progress on, onwards to AML, which is um, uh, a serious form of leukemia. So um, this is a, a disease that uh, affects uh, both men and women. Um, it's more common in men, but, um, more, but very importantly, it, it's, it's a disease of the elderly population. So, for example, typically MDS patients are between the ages of 60 and 75. And this is important because it really limits um, treatment options. Um, for, for, for instance, um, probably the only curative therapy for MDS at this point is bone marrow transplantation. But because of the age of the patient um, and because of health, this is not a, a viable treatment option for, for many MDS patients. 